Welcome to Too Complicated for History. I am Isaac S. Loftus, and I am joined by my more knowledgeable co-host, Dr. Lynn Price Robbins. As we do every other week, we're here to discuss the history that was cut from your curriculum, the history that your teacher edited out of the syllabus because it wasn't going to be on the test. Today, we have a particularly gruesome topic for the spookiest of holidays. You know how sometimes you put something down somewhere, and then when you go back, it's just not there anymore? Well, in Indiana, around the turn of the 20th century, that happened with people's bodies. Today, we're talking grave robbing with Chris Fluke. This is Too Complicated for History. Welcome to Too Complicated for History. I am Isaac Loftus, and as always, I am joined by my ever-knowledgeable co-host, Dr. Lynn Price Robbins, where we discuss the stuff that fell through the cracks of your curriculum, the things that your professor uh, edited out of that syllabus. Um, Today, we have an incredibly spooky episode for the holiday. Uh, Lynn, would you like to introduce our very special guest and his book? Absolutely. So today for our guest, we have Chris Fluke, who is the author of Indianapolis Grave Robbing, A Syndicate of Death, which is very excited. And he also teaches media studies and is a public historian. So I want to start out by saying happy Halloween to everybody, if you're listening to this on the day that it comes out. And I absolutely love spooky stuff. It's my favorite holiday. And so I really, really love this book. Um, That'll probably come through. So the first thing I want to ask is if you could just give the audience a brief overview of what exactly you studied and how you got into it, because I like that too. So in 1902, in the fall of 1902, seven men were arrested for grave robbing in the city of Indianapolis. It was a particular type of grave robbing. They went and stole bodies, um, fresh corpses. I'm not sure how best to describe it. (laughs) People that had recently died and had recently been buried. And they would go under the cover of night, steal those bodies and sell them to medical schools as cadavers. It wasn't illegal for medical schools to have cadavers. There was legal ways to get them, but there just was never enough bodies. So this black market was created. Story was kind of overshadowed at first because uh, Teddy Roosevelt was in town. (laughs) But then uh, one of the uh, lead grave robbers was turned state's evidence and just divulged tons of information. And then so the story then covers uh, in the book the trials, the the, the the grand jury testimony, the trials, and then like the aftermath of what happened. And is this, did you grow up in Indianapolis? Is this something that you sort of always knew about? Yeah, is this folklore from local folklore? Yeah, more, uh, yeah it, more or less. Uh, I grew up in Muncie, which is about a half hour, 45 minutes uh, to the north of Indianapolis. The story has been told a lot through uh, other podcasts and blog posts. The mm. Indiana Historical Bureau even put a marker out near where a gunfight between two <laughs> two bands of gray robbers <laughs> happened in the northern part of the county. Oh, wow. Um, so the story is pretty well known. And then what I did when the pandemic hit, I found myself with a lot of time. And so I went back and read seven months worth of newspaper uh, articles that explored and talked about this story. It was very well covered in the press and then ended up with enough information to do a book. Which is absolutely fantastic. And so the first thing I want to, to ask, because I had so much fun reading about this. Um, so in your title, it says grave robbing. Can you walk us through how you robbed a grave? Not you personally, <laughs> but how these grave robbers. Sure. I mean, let's actually... not assume, Lynn. <laughs> let's true. not assume. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, in Indianapolis, and this is what happened in Indianapolis happened all over the United States. Any major sure. community that had a medical school or medical schools, this kind of thing happened in the 19th century. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times it was an un, um, 
everyone knew it, but there was no way to really enforce it. No one wants to be the first body that a surgeon operates on. Right. So like right. society and culture understood and respected the idea that there needed to be anatomical research, but there just never, there was no cold storage embalming existed, but it just wasn't as pre- prevalent as, you know, you can embalm a hundred people for a semester and put them in a refrigerator. Those schools just didn't have that. Right. Yeah. I imagine embalming would probably make because it changes the nature, the chemical nature of the body, it probably hurts the the medical pursuit. dissection. Oh, yeah, the mm-hmm. dissection part of it. Yeah. So a lot of a lot of times, what happened was they'd get tipped off that someone died, and they target like rural cemeteries, places that they could go to in the middle of the night, no street lights, maybe farm fields, but like you know something they could get in and get out without being bothered. And so uh, Indianapolis had tons. Now all of Marion County is Indianapolis, but at the time, Indianapolis was much smaller. And then you had these surrounding mm-hmm. communities, surrounding rural cemeteries. They'd go out, dig up the cemetery, uh, dig up the grave. The grave was, um, there, there'd be fresh dirt because the person had been buried that afternoon or that morning or the day before. So they could dig it up without raising a lot of suspicion. They'd break into the center. The group in Indianapolis would break into this uh, center of the coffin, pull the body out. Uh, This particular crew also stole gold teeth, jewelry, whatever, Hmm. and then covered dirt back up on the grave um, and then would go to one of the half dozen medical schools in Indianapolis and sell the body. And another thing you mentioned in the book was they would use like a match for lighting. It's not like they had flashlights. I mean, they did not have flashlights. It'd be lowered (laughs) down. One person would be lowered down into the cemetery with with a match. And that's all the light that they had. And they would either hook the body under the chin with like a like a massive like hook and Mm. pull the body out. Or they would just uh, Rufus's uh, the head grave robber in Indianapolis would wrap the body in rope because they dug in the center of the coffin. Mm -hmm. And they just pulled it out that way. So it'd be like four or five people up above the grave that did the did the work, or they'd have a winch or something to pull it up, pull the body up. All right, not to get Ooh. graphic here, but like <laughs> just imagine the logistics of of like winching around to someone's waist, and they're going to break through the center of a coffin. We're talking about like yeah. folding in half as you're coming up, yeah, kind of thing. I'm like, yep. God, <laughs> gruesome. So, I mean, so like, getting as, delivered like in pristine condition. I no, would imagine. No, no. With, I mean, you know, like, being, better than what. I mean, as as pristine as they possibly could, but yeah, sure, they were the yeah. bodies came in rough. <laughs> <laughs> Where'd you get these? Nowhere. They're just covered <laughs> in dirt. <laughs> yeah. like, mm-hmm. What are you I talking about? I was, I was mm-hmm. funny. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I guess was 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 the shortage of cadavers for the medical school was that mostly on? I imagine that the demand for it just couldn't be high enough, right? We'll take whatever you got. Because everyone needs to learn, right? So, like, it doesn't right. really matter what the supply side is voluntarily, I suppose, right? Right. The older take more. Uh, well, a lot of what a lot of what happened was that the state of Indiana, like most states, um, tried to regulate licensing. Said so if you want to practice medicine in the United States or in the state of Indiana, you got to have a license. And so, in the 19th century was full of the state trying to make laws to. Uh, make the best doctors available. Mm -hmm. And one of the requirements was that you had to have a medical degree and medical degrees were like a dime a dozen. There were some very, very like rigorous (laughs) trained doctors in medical schools. And then you had like quack people. And so there were, there was a lot of competition in Indianapolis. And so you had a half dozen schools, everybody need 30, 40, 50 bodies for the semester Mm. It, was, it just there wasn't enough in a legal way to get it, and so the black market filled the filled the gap. I mean, I mean, I guess donating your body to science isn't a particularly popular thing even today. Um, you know, every once in a while I hear horror stories of like people doing that, and then like, lo and behold, the U.S. military got a hold of it and it was like, we're just going to test what this new grenade does. <laughs> right? <laughs> if like people yes. want that to be the thing, mm-hmm. <laughs> like I was hoping you think you're helping learn. doctors and you're just getting blown up? Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of um, uh, the culture just thought, I mean, even like you said, even today, people yeah. are now if you donate your body to science, they'll do their thing and then it cremate, it's cremated then it's sent back to the family to be buried. Sure. I don't know that that was the case in the late 19th century. Mm-hmm. And I just the culture, people were uncomfortable because it's it's, um, you know, it treats the human body as a thing. And it's my grandma. And so, like, there, there, right. was, there was not a lot of donation that happened in the late 19th century. 
yeah, I guess it's like, like a little bit of turning of a blind eye because I, I think we've talked about yeah. this before with our it, with our audience at some point, but like a lot of teeth that dentists had made dentures out mm-hmm. of were acquired illicitly. <laughs> But there's an old saying that there was um, the best time to go to a dentist was, that, was right after there was a big battle in your area, because uh, <laughs> you know there was when there were a lot of extra teeth yeah. available. So like I, I imagine it's sort of a turning a blind eye to this kind of thing. It's necessary, yeah. but I don't want to know about it necessarily. <laughs> but that's um, this is on a whole nother level, right? And you, you talk so, about how yeah, they they did try. I mean, the medical school, schools did try to find legal ways to do it. Um, and I think the one that that baffled me the most is that they wanted to make it legal to just anytime anyone died in an orphanage, any kind of public institution, a prison, that they were just given the body. That that that's one yeah. of the thoughts, which is kind of there baffling. Were, <laughs> I think there was like three like three sets of laws in 1875, 1879, and then uh, right before my the story of my book in 1899. The Indiana General Assembly tried to provide legal ways, and you're exactly right. It was wards of the state, people that lived mm-hmm. in county asylums. There were a couple of mental health institutions, but like permanent, you know, people that were had very severe mental health. Um, and then those bodies, criminals, people that were executed, and people that the state had control over right. and could give bodies. Sure. But it was it was even in Indiana, it just was never enough for the demand of the number of students that these schools needed in the end of the 19th century. I would imagine, too, they want people without family, living family members to come and say, yeah. how dare you? You know, because then there's yeah, no made way it to easier, <laughs> which is terrible. Yep. But, you know, yep. so did families ever find out? Is that a thing that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so in the second chapter of the book, I survey, um, I don't know, about a dozen different grave robbing cases that happened before 1902. Mm-hmm. And they, they, the families would, would find out someone would be tipped off or that there would be um, a sextant would notice something was off and then they would go in and they'd have to dig up the grave and they'd find their missing loved one. Or they find the grave without uh, their loved one in it. <laughs> So the, the grave robbers would cover their tracks. They wouldn't just leave an open hole when they left. Correct. The, yeah. Okay. They would dig it back. And so like if the body was buried that morning, you, the grave robbers came out that night, the ground is already disturbed. They right. put the dirt back. The next morning, the sexton is going to be, well, you know, looked like it did when I left it yesterday. And there's right. no one. Yeah. They'd be none the wiser. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. And you start your book uh, talking about how someone received an anonymous message saying, you know, your daughter is no longer in her grave. Go check. Which is a very disturbing, you know, message as it yes. is. Okay, that's uh-huh. awkward. Uh-huh. Um, There's a couple of scenarios that, that could lead to that. One, zombies. <laughs> two, <laughs> great. Yeah. I guess just those two, right? There's not a lot of yeah, options. Yeah, yeah. And uh, did you, or does anyone have any theories on who those sort of anonymous informants were? Like guilty feeling grave robbers or... Well, yes. And so it is implied in the trials that it was Rufus Cantrell, right. the, the, mm-hmm. the main grave robber that did it. And they had two theories. The newspapers had two theories, neither of which I entirely fully believe because okay. they're very sensational. But but that's the best knowledge that we have. One was that Central College of Physicians and Surgeons canceled his contract and they went with another grave robber. So he was, you know, getting back. OK, <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to get back at you. So you're going to cancel my contract. The other. The more disturbing story was he went out with his crew to rob a grave of a young woman. He uh, got the body to Central College and in the light of the basement realized it was his girlfriend yes. who died of typhoid like oh, a couple of weeks no. before and completely freaks out and has, uh, I don't know, a change of heart <laughs> and then tells her mother and then tells a couple of other people um, that their loved, their recently deceased loved one had uh, has is now in the basement of such a crash. Right. As, as traumatic as that kind of scenario is, like, what did he think people who were related or knew these people would have felt? Like, he was like, "Oh my goodness, I had no idea that it would be this." <laughs> that <family."> anyone would <laughs> care so much. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. but someone, somebody knew. Yeah, somebody knew. Yeah. yeah, really, you gotta. It's, it's you know, you have to experience it yourself. To really know the effect of grave robbing exactly. yeah, really has effect on our family. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I don't know that I, I believe either one, but if, if the if the newspapers before Kentrell and his group was arrested, 
they're printing these stories about someone going around tipping off people. Mm -hmm. So even what's what ultimately leads up to his arrest, because the cops have to respond because all these people are getting notes Mm -hmm. slipped under their door and phone calls. And they're like, they have to respond. Um, So I I do believe that 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 part is accurate. I just... Was it really Cantrell? Right, exactly. Like, what was his motivation? It's there's sure. no other source other than the newspapers, and I I trust the newspapers. I trust the general arc of the news that the newspapers are telling the the arc of the story correctly. Mm-hmm. The particulars, it was just he had a lot of motivation to run with rumors that weren't always you know or turned out to be completely false. So sorry for the interruption, but we're going to take a brief break now for a word from our sponsors. I, I imagine if there's. We, were they paying well? Like, was this a good job? Like, yeah. if if you you know, it was it, it was a lucrative field to be in. <laughs> Literally, it was I mean, lucrative it was... fields to be in, and also like a field. <laughs> Your profession. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I mean, like like this is it sounds really macabre, but the people that were Rufus in particular, but the other sort of lead grave robbers were experienced grave robbers. They were experienced body snatchers. Huh. One guy had been practicing all the way since the 1880s. And so they had like 20 years of experience <laughs> to be able to do it. Um, so it, it did require a particular skill and I think a particular kind of just demeanor you yeah. know, uh, to be able to go and do it night after night after night. After yeah, night. Really good vision. No and, doubt. In the dark. <laughs> or not good vision. I mean, you really like don't want to see everything yeah, yeah, you're doing uh, maybe the details. they go either way <laughs> hey my goodness anyway um sorry <laughs> <laughs> i'm just trying to wrap my head around the it, uh, and, and just for the context of our audience i guess the were coffins different i because my so my cousin's own are, are is a funeral director uh and it's funeral yeah. home multi-generational whatever i've seen like the coffins and stuff that people are buried in they're pretty sturdy yeah like if you get you're not getting through that Mm-mm. without some serious equipment with and a making shovel some you're noise. not yeah um yeah just with a shovel you need like an axe or something like that or a saw or some of some sort were, what were people typically buried in back then was like pine boxes or just- um yeah pine boxes like a lot of wooden caskets mm-hmm. uh they had i mean there were burial vaults it was not that okay. dissimilar to today but one of the one of the in in part by uh, targeting rural graves we targeted poor people places right. that they knew that they there was not a lot of there wasn't anything nice below the ground mm-hmm. that they could they could easily pull out or pry open the coffin of a relative or the lid of a relatively cheap coffin right, right, right. Um, by targeting people of a lower socioeconomic background. And so it was, they, they, they did not go after rich people that could afford what you're talking about. Like nice, really nice, secure. Yeah. And I think, I think there's payment plans nowadays so that they're accessible yeah, to everyone. Right. So like mm-hmm. back then, probably not so much. <laughs> yeah. No. So you've mentioned uh, Rufus Cantrell a few times and he's a really fascinating guy. So can you sort of introduce him to our audience and yeah. tell us a little bit about him? Uh, he was born in around 1880 in Gallatin, Tennessee. It's not, it, he lied a lot. So he, he also <laughs> said he was born in 1879, 1881, 1882. But by the time my story takes place in 1902, he's about 22, 23, 20, 24 years old. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. He moves to Indianapolis in 1893 with some of his family members and gets a job as a porter. And then um, at some point, he's a teenager at that point, he starts working at a uh, funeral home and becomes an undertaker's assistant. And then that somewhere in that connection, grave robbing was always already going on. Mm-hmm. So my guess is he went out one night needing to bo- needing to get a body and then showed how skilled he was and then ended up doing it uh, on his own. He was also really active in um, uh, politics. He was a Republican. He was African American, and so he uh, several times in the uh, before and then after. Um, the trials, he was involved with uh, raising African-American support for specific candidates. So mm-hmm. during the trial, before the trials, he was a Republican. And then after the trials, he switched parties to the, Demo- to the Democratic Party. And he was huh. raising votes amongst the African-American community. He was charismatic. Like, the, I get the sense, you know, because this is a newspaper, so, you know, you have to read it with a critical eye. But I get the sense that the cops loved him. Mm-hmm. And people loved him. He was funny. He was gregarious. Uh, no one was, you know, no one was really damning of him, even in the papers, Mm -hmm. a black man in a predominantly white city. Like there was not as much criticism as I was expecting when I went back to read it. 
Hmm. Um, and I think it's because lots of people liked him and he was a personable guy. Is that true for other black men who were involved in this? Like that got caught no. and stuff like that? Or was he Rufus? Rufus? Just Rufus. The, he had like a lieutenant named Sam Martin that's sometimes quoted in the paper. But the other the other guys, we hear no, nothing. Mm-hmm. We hear no, there's no, in the history as, as it's been preserved, there's no statements. There's no recollection. They, we don't hear the grand jury testimony. It's just really Rufus primarily. The other white grave robbers and then Sam Martin. Huh. Oh, that's interesting. He was a pretty unique guy, then. Yeah, it was. It's very yeah. unfortunate that, like you said, there's not enough sources to write a good biography of him because he should be a starring in a movie. I mean, there should be a movie, he and should. he should be the star. Yes. Seriously, <laughs> I mean, he really should. Everyone liked him. You know, he's stealing bodies, but I, we, we think of racing being involved in public politics after the fact. At all, it's like, <laughs> yeah. like everyone's okay, bodies like, in their closet, right? So they, people. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, some Skeletons, less but. literal than others. Um, <laughs> So I think we, we, we've alluded to there being competing like groups of folks mm-hmm. um, because uh, I mean, even in the title of the book, it's called syndicate. Like, so like how organized and how large was the people that, you know, um, uh, Rufus Cantrell was rolling with? So we don't really fully know because, you know, these people didn't write it down. Rufus claimed that his crew alone stole 100 bodies from Indianapolis cemeteries in the summer of 1902 alone. But the papers kind of estimate maybe 300 from all of central Indiana. So going from the Ohio border, you know, places that could be accessible to Indianapolis by a train in an urban wagon, something, you know, a day's ride or a couple hours by a train. Um, but uh, there's evidence going all the way back to the 1870s. Uh, there were at least two other, there were two other white led grave robbing uh, gangs in Marion County that were operating at the same time. And then one pretty prominent one in Hamilton County. That's the documented, four documented gangs in the area. But they also had dirty sextants, dirty undertakers, dirty <laughs> cops. Like, like there was there was a conspiracy. Lots of people knew about this. And the only real reason why the police, I get the impression, the only real reason the police went after it is because so many people were banging on police doors saying, I need a warrant to go search this hospital. And like, there's just no way that they could ignore it. Right. My family member's gone. Yeah. Someone took them. I right. want to go find them. Yeah. Right. I, I, I can see why that would be a motivating thing. <laughs> Whereas yeah. if the families yeah. hadn't found out, it would have just continued, I imagine, because yeah. there's no one to complain. I'm not sure if there's enough history for or evidence for this, but were there any, do we understand how they operated? Like, were there any rules that they, that they went by? Like, was there any sort of like moral, like, you know, gentleman's code amongst uh, is the word ghouls? Is that like a thing that they were called? Yeah. Like, yeah, uh, yeah. Called ghouls. Also, resurrectionists. Yep. That was my favorite. Resurrectionists. <laughs> that's, pre- that's, a, that's a good one, too. That's a good, yeah, that's a good word. <laughs> Resur- Resurrectionist comes from um, uh, A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Oh, right. There's a, char- there's a character in that book named Jerry C- Cruncher, and he's a resurrectionist. He's a body snatcher stealing bodies. Mm-hmm. And so, like, that term was used often. A ghoul is a like a pre-Islamic Arabic like creature, like folkloric creature that would steal stuff from cemeteries, bodies from cemeteries. So like that term has been popularized in the 19th century to explain, you know, <laughs> yeah. these people right. that were doing it. Um, but oh, so to what were, you were about to say that I talk about the, um, uh, uh, was there any sort of like rules that they abided by or oh, like yeah. there, you know, moral structure that they... Uh, uh, um, so some of this, not all, we don't, there's, you know, whatever came out on the trials is what happened. The, uh, the, yeah. the grave robber in Hamilton County was a man named Wade West. He was a former Confederate soldier, which is a weird other right. backstory, <laughs> but they, him and Rufus were competitors somewhere in 1900, 1901. There was even a gun battle in one of the cemeteries in Southern Hamilton County, which is the, the county just North of Marion County. Um, but at some point, they came to an agreement that they that Wade refers to them as blood brothers, whatever that meant. So they made some sort of pact <laughs> with blood <laughs> that they would respect people's territories. And so they had some sort of internal area where they would divide. Some grave robbers, I don't think these folks, but some grave robbers didn't steal teeth. They took the clothes off and put them back down. They were a little bit more respectful. Oh, they just took stuff. Of, <laughs> yeah. And then, but other people were just like, you know, what's we're already done this thing. What's taking out the gold teeth. There's nothing, you know, right. it's yeah. just one more thing. 
I mean, when you said Blood Brothers, this is one of the few times where I was like, I hope it was their own blood that they swore over. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> oh my goodness. I, I One thing I have to say about the book is you have some amazing images. Some of them that I was kind of almost horrified by. I mean, there's some images yeah. of them dissecting, of what a dissecting room looked like. If you can sort of explain that to to our listeners, I mean, you really want to go out and get this book and see these images. But if you could give them sort of a, a you know, a mental image of what these so things one of the, are. Sure. One of the things that I wanted to do, uh, because I, I read all this stuff, it's in the public domain. And so um, I wanted to find images. I wanted to find images that could tell the story but that were in the public domain. I just thought that would be a great way to sort of tell the book. And so the Welcome Collection which is actually based in London, is an um, archive, online archive that's got tons of historical photos. And for whatever reason, they have a collection of gray robbing stuff. So <laughs> I included those. Uh, all the mugshots of the folks that have eventually get, to, get uh, um, to get sent to prison. Uh, I found stuff in the Library of Congress from the bench in, uh, it's called Indianapolis Bench and Bar. And so it showed all the lawyers. Mm-hmm. So the judges, lawyers, prosecutors, they were all there. Some pretty gruesome photos showing. Um, I debated about not putting that in there, mm-hmm. but I think it, I wanted to make sure readers knew what they were looking at or what what the story Absolutely. was. These people were taking bodies and doing research, which wasn't wrong because again, you don't want to be your doctor's first body that he's operating no. on. Exactly. Like there's just they go to no. these basements and there just be body parts everywhere. And they're <laughs> in Indianapolis. The preservation method was brining and pickle bats so there was like the smell like vinegar all over the place it's just huh. gross you would never eat you know. a pickle after being in there i imagine no, <laughs> <you would not. laughs> wait they would they would they would they would take a body yeah put it in a vat and, and, and pickle it yep sort huh. of, that's sort of like mm-hmm. freezing or, or keeping it cool right it keeps it fresh yeah. i mean <laughs> it keeps it fresh enough uh to where you could come out and do it now like refrigeration existed and embalming existed mm-hmm. But like it just it, they couldn't stockpile 30. There was not refrigeration enough that they could stockpile 30 bodies right. in the basement of these <laughs> medical schools. For, for, so brining was the best. I don't know why you thought I, I thought you were about to say if you like refrigeration existed, they did the pickling for fun. <laughs> 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 like they just chose to, well, yeah, I guess. Well, inter- you're the, you're, uh, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, interestingly enough that when uh, the body, when, when all this, when all this broke, all right. So people start going into cemeteries and digging up their loved ones to see if they were there or not. And so they weren't. And then all the colleges, all the bodies legal or not from the colleges disappear. They just disappear. Mm-hmm. They know this because the cops go in to um, search the places and there's no bodies right before yeah. their terms. What's that big pickle vat for? Nothing. <laughs> I like <laughs> pickles. <laughs> <laughs> so it is rumored. It was rumored that the, the the colleges freaked out and they sold their bodies to Louisville, Cincinnati, Chicago medical schools. And then in early October, thirty bodies show up in an ice cream factory in Louisville, just hanging, dead bodies hanging. And so someone's like, "Well, there's the Indianapolis bodies." So the Indianapolis police go down, get a warrant to search. There are not Indianapolis bodies. They are completely legal, used for some Louisville medical school. For ice they, cream. Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, so they they uh, they had to preserve them for their winter term. Right, right, right. So they they contracted with an ice cream factory to store the bodies in the back with the ice cream until they were ready to get them for dissection. <laughs> All completely, completely legal. <laughs> completely legal. Completely normal. Doesn't make you hungry for ice cream. That's for no, sure. I, I don't know. <laughs> what is that? By the way, that, that being sort of in a food place really reminds we, we talked about the creation of the FDA and sort of like the regulation in the meatpacking industry in Chicago mm-hmm. with uh, in t- TR and, and another episode that we recently released. <laughs> this goes to show you again, th- people really needed to be food inspecting these places. Like they, they, people <laughs> yeah. needed to go and check, <laughs> make sure people were washing their hands. There's no bodies mm-hmm. hanging in the back. And just bump into the bodies and second. then go get a scoop of ice cream. Um, yeah. Uh, to, to your point about um, not being wanting to be your doctor's first uh, uh, surgery, I, um, I don't know if you've ever seen the series that w- was on Cinemax a little while ago that uh, Soderbergh called the the Nick it was about a hospital yeah. around this time or whatever. But if, if any of anyone listening is um, not watched it and is really curious what surgery sort of looked like, they do a pretty good job of of really showing you like how brutal it was at that in that time because they were just figuring stuff out 
<laughs> you know, like yeah. operating theaters with people watching because they're like, oh, I really they're going to try that on what? Who? I think Jerry Seinfeld did a bit about that. But like that was yeah. literally how they were learning um, yeah. with people uh, that which is, uh, yeah, you wanted them to practice on a, on, a, on a dead body before, like, you know, injecting anesthetic into your spine for the first time. It definitely does feel like a moral quandary because, you know, it. You don't want your family member's body to be sold and things done to them. But then if you're the one in the hospital, you yeah. don't want to be the experiment either. So that yeah. is a tough, you know. Was there any religious grounds for the object? I mean, obviously, there probably was religious grounds for, you know, desecration of 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 the dead. But it, w was that... I'm, I'm finding it shocking that Rufus was sort of like allowed to like operate in society after having done this. <laughs> so was well, it a lot, this stuff had gone on for a hundred, hundred, a hundred years, well over a hundred years in the Western yeah. world. There was a huge riot in New York city in 1788 when um, I forget the name of the college, but there was a medical college there that was ransacking primarily African American cemeteries. And when they stole the body of one white person and then the city freaks out and then they ran, they ransacked the whole college. The state militia had to be called out. So people like knew about this. Right. And right. It, like uh, the civil war brought not necessarily advancements, but a need for anatomical research, because as you were talking about, you know, how violent it was to get your limbs hacked off. It was just like all of medical science needed to grow because of that, especially when it came to anatomy. And then like, we understood germ theory in the late 19th century, as opposed to miasma theory, which was this old, uh, outdated belief of how disease was spread, bloodletting and leeches, all that sort of goes away in the throughout the 19th century towards a more rigorous scientific approach to it. It's just the law and the culture did not catch up. So it was religious, but I also think it was just culture. We mm -hmm. bury this person in a ceremony religious right. or not and now you're violating that right that that's the problem they're no longer yeah. resting peacefully you've stolen yeah. them and not not told us i yeah. think for christians it was specific because it violated the second coming your right. this grandma's body is not going to be raised because it was torn apart in some basement of a medical college so sorry for the interruption but we're going to take a brief break now for a word from our sponsors well, that's depending a very on good your point. reading of Revelation, I suppose, it's supposed to get like reassembled. I don't know if, you, I don't know if you've ever seen any of those yeah. old depictions of yeah. Revelation. They're like people coming out of animals that were, had eaten them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And that, yeah. Oh, well it's then, like, why did they worry? In, in theory, I guess, but like, or she's going to be reassembled out of whatever happened to yeah. her. And that's what's going to be judged. But that, yeah, no, that, 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 that makes sense. It, it jives with some other stuff that we've talked about as far as the progressive era as a whole. It was, you know, they looked around at all the maladies of, of, of around them and sort of like, we can fix this if we just are rigorous enough at, you know, trying to study it. It's sort of like applied to pretty, applied to pretty much everything, um, yeah. including like mental health and society. That's yeah. like where the eugenics movement came from. We've ch chatted about this about, uh, uh, and, and some other episodes as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it gets labeled progressive, but there's a lot of unintended, really unfortunate, uh, yeah, unfortunate outcomes from that line of logical thinking. Yeah. Um, it leads you to some really pretty, pretty unfortunate ends. Um, so to get back to this story in particular, um, what happened with the trial? So like, how, how did the trial all like shake out? What was the, the result of this? Oh, and if I can just jump in too, um, you sort of also weave in this idea of how race affected the trial. So oh, right. could you touch on that too? Because it's, sure. you know, very yeah. interesting, uh, sort of note woven throughout your book. So when uh, Rufus, Rufus and his crew were arrested, there were seven men. Uh, they were all identified as African-American. And then Rufus and one or two others would turn state's evidence and just give up tons of people. And then the cops go around and arrest lots of people, the vast majority of whom were white. Mm -hmm. Other grave robbers, sextants, um, people, uh, morticians. And then uh, about five doctors that were working at across three different colleges, three of the six, seven, eight colleges that were in. Uh, Indianapolis at the time, three that were arrested that were either directly stealing bodies with the grave robbers or were sort of masterminding from the college's perspective. Uh, the first person to go to go to trial was Joseph Alexander. He was the lead anatomist at the Central College of Physicians and Surgeons. His trial ends in a hung jury. Then they uh, put Sam Martin on trial. He's African-American. He's found guilty. Rufus is found guilty. 
uh, two or three other guys just plead guilty, and then everybody else is either let off or um, the pros- prosecutors in, in Indianapolis decide not to pursue it. The one exception was the the Confederate ghoul at Wade West from Hamilton County. So um, it wasn't that the black guys were innocents because they weren't, but they were no less guilty than the other folks. The vast majority of the conspiracy was run, managed, and led by white people. They targeted this seven-person African-American crew because they could, because it was a racist, just like today, a racist criminal justice system that, right. that unfairly targeted people of color. And then they got bad, they got, they, they got bad legal advice. They got right. like, they didn't get the same support that like where the doctors were arrested, the colleges paid for their bail, you know? So like, they just, it was a completely, it was two systems based on race. Yeah, well, those, officially say so. yeah, I mean, those, those doctors were definitely the fall guys for the, that whole system. It's not like the university or the colleges themselves didn't realize that this was what how they were getting yes. all of these corpses. Right. <laughs> and it seemed like it also the class because, you know, the, the class structure, because the doctors seemed to they could say, oh, well, you know, I didn't know where they got it from. I, I think Dr. Alexander's trial, he says, well, I don't know where he got the body from. I, I assumed it was legal, so I bought it from him. It's like, come on, yeah. man. But I mean, it was enough <laughs> to make the jury fight over it and not, you know, not agree. Yeah, and then if he, and then as you know, because you because you read the book, but the the Alexander's defense attorneys were, were their basic defense was, are you going to believe a group of African Americans over a white established doctor? I mean, come on. And the jury was like, yeah, that doesn't make any sense because they were also exhibited the same kind of bigotry that, that, uh, that everybody else did at the time. Right. I'm just imagining him saying that with like the guiltiest looking doctor I've ever seen in my entire life. Like right. someone covered <laughs> in blood. I didn't know. <laughs> with money falling out of his pockets. I, I had no idea where he was getting those corpses. Anyway, back to him. I got to refill Fingers my crossed, find his back. Yeah. <laughs> 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 That's, I mean, that is, um, I mean, I, given what they were doing, I, I mean, I don't feel like disappointing. Like, it's like you're saying they are, yes, they were guilty. And this is pretty heinous, um, you know, treatment of regardless of how you feel about, you know, that, that it's nece- that medically necessary. You would hope that people need to go into these things willingly, <laughs> these arrangements willingly. Yeah. And, and there's some con- right. level of consent and your body autonomy, or at least your family's mm-hmm. um, intentions with your remains is sort of what trumps that. But like, that is unfortunate that that you know that that was the uh, uh, the racial disparity during the trial, <laughs> right? And you know you have all these all these people who are not even investigated. But how long does Rufus Cantrell end up being in prison? I mean, this affects the whole rest of his life. It does. He's in prison. Uh, I mean, the penalties were not that stiff. I mean, they, he was in prison for like four years, five years, mm-hmm. like not very long. And his was the worst mm-hmm. sentence. Everybody else was out in like one or two. Mm-hmm. Huh. Um, he comes out, works. He's not allowed his parole. He's not allowed to live in Indianapolis. So he uh, works in Anderson, a nearby city, if you're unfamiliar. And then um, when the parole term is over, he goes back to Indianapolis and starts fun, uh, like drumming up political support for Democratic candidates. And then he leans in the 19 teens. He leans into his grave robber image by like. I'm going to bury my opponent. Oh, really? know, like, I, I just, just yeah. trying to think of something pithy or catchy to say. But I was like, what was his slogan? No. Like, yeah. <laughs> so this, there is, I, don't know because I cannot find the information. I suspect there's a much larger conspiracy when he was in jail, but not in prison, but when he was in jail waiting the trial, essentially um, the mayor of Indianapolis comes Charles Bookwalder to talk to him in jail. The press reports on it hmm. as though he's coming to talk to, because some woman from St. Louis was curious that her cousin's brother's son was someone random was like, might've been stolen. So could you go check it out? She called the mayor's office and the mayor's mayor goes and talks to Kentrell. Uh, but Kentrell prior to being arrested was the head of, it was like the, the African-American for Charles Bookwalter in Indianapolis. It was a mm-hmm. political group in support. So they knew each other before. They knew each other before. Right. And then in 1902, he goes to visit him. Like what was really discussed right. at. <laughs> so. That's f- It's like you fascinating. wish they had the recording devices back then. Yes. In the- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, you know, it, it feels like there's something larger that like this is sort of like indicative of something bigger, but I, I can't even imagine, begin to imagine 
what it would be. I mean, the grave robbing itself is so sensational. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, well, some of it, I think, is just like, um, you know, I'm guessing, and this is just conjecture, so just, sure. you know, listeners should not just take it with a grain of salt, but like, a lot, of, a lot of Indianapolis was run by Republicans, and that's not a political statement, but they were all friendly with each other. Mm-hmm. A lot of them were Civil War veterans. The Mason, 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 Masonic lodges were all prominent all over. So I kind of get the suspi- suspicion that it was just like white people helping white people out, that, you know, that there was better support to, to help. The cops had to investigate because the public was so pissed off. Mm-hmm. But all the legal and political machinery of the city sort of rallied around the white people. They right. tried to get the black guys off uh, by claiming that they were all insane. That didn't yeah. work. And then they then they just went to blame them for, for everything. Sure. You know, then the mayor goes to apologize. To refer to <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I, think what he did is, I think what he did is to go to threaten them. I think people went wow. in all the time to threaten them. There were tons of doctors that were never mentioned uh, one mm-hmm. guy in particular, a doctor named Goethe Link, uh, in 1977, this guy was in his 90s, he wrote an article in the Indiana Medical Review Quarterly or whatever and talks about grave robbing when he was a young man and talks about mm-hmm. going and threatening Rufus Cantrell mm-hmm. in prison. He just says it kind of matter-of-factly and, you know, what? 70 years later uh, from when it happened. Oh and... Um, his name is never mentioned in none of the newspapers. I actually found it at the end of my research, just kind of by happenstance, that this, this doctor, Gertha Link, was never mentioned at the time, even though he was involved with it. So I think oh, that so just says that there's lots more. There's more to the story that will never right. be. Right. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't give up everything. Um, That's right. With yeah. All the names. Oh, OK. That, that, makes, that makes some sense. That is crazy that that – I mean, I, I – I, I like in my head, I understand how recent 1902 was, but, uh, um, but Lynn still. and I typically are talking about <laughs> early American revolutionary areas. Right, you know? so like, right. No one living <laughs> was ever recorded that we, we normally talk about was ever recorded on a microphone. So, like, mm-hmm. th- this is like, a, uh, that there might be like, um, a uh, like a slide photograph of that gentleman somewhere yeah. in. <laughs> oh, there's a documentary. Someone made a documentary in 1981. Uh, he died in like, 79, but he had done an uh-huh. interview in the late 70s when he was like 94, 95 years old, and they made a documentary about it. And, he, and in the documentary, yep, in the documentary, he explains, yep, there was what, an African American do- fellow. What is this documentary uh, called? Well, I'm, I'm going to try to hunt that. I'll send it to you. It, yeah, is, it is at the uh, John Shaw Billings Archive on IU Medical School's campus in Indianapolis. That sounds amazing. And so, uh, that, Gerta Link, like most of the other doctors, had long successful, wonderful careers throughout the 20th century um, yeah. because nothing ever happened to them <laughs> from, from great rubbing. Right, because Ruf- Rufus Cantrell kept his mouth shut, I guess. Yeah. For some folks, yeah. Yeah for some, yeah, for some of those folks. But that's, that's wild. Um, and you have to <laughs> wonder, so says, yeah. during this trial when everybody's get you know, every, all the people are getting dragged in and they're being questioned, what happens to... The medical schools did they just have to not have a semester because now obviously they don't want to go rob bodies while everyone's on trial for it so the original title i wanted the original title to be famine of cadavers and like i said like the indianapolis the publisher was like if you don't put indianapolis in it they're not going to publish it but that <laughs> that phrase a famine of cadavers mm-hmm. comes from a story that was published in early december in indianapolis news or the indianapolis journal and um the college, all grave robbing stopped in fall wow. of 1902. <laughs> like all the oh other grave gosh. robbers fled or they mm. just stopped. And so all these colleges had winter terms that they did not have bodies. And then oh, they gosh. called it a famine of cadavers. Uh, but grave robbing picks up again in 1903. There's a, re- uh, I actually, the prologue of my book is about a grave robbing attempt in a small community near where I live called DeSoto in 1904. So it like dipped down, but then they just started again <laughs> as soon as, as soon as they felt the pressure was off. Yeah, it's kind of back to you know, it. Gotta wait till things to cool off. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, yeah. Doctors got to learn. So surgeons got to you know yep. cut things open to yeah. see how they work. Absolutely. <laughs> oh oh but, man. So how did all of this end? How did was it because they got better coffins, or um, did something happen that they were getting enough bodies? suddenly in medical schools 
Yeah, by pretty much by the teens into World War One, mm-hmm. um, the embalming had become widespread. Embalming had existed since the Civil War, but well, I mean for thousands of years actually. But like modern embalming methods had existed for several decades. They became pervasive, um, easy, easily done. Training was was spread to all morticians and, and others. Uh, the laws were improved and so that uh, it was a better better uh, way in which these colleges could uh, could get cadavers Mm -hmm. refrigeration of refrigeration like large refrigerated facilities that came online and then a lot of the medical schools all the medical schools in indianapolis consolidated so they could afford things like like um embalming and refrigeration and that kind of thing Mm -hmm. because like a morgue they could have an on-site morgue because there was not 17 different schools. There was only one. Right. And you could keep bodies for a lot longer in good yep. condition. Because I will say in some of those images, the bodies, I don't know if it's just because of the image, or but they look already like half decayed. And then they're yeah. digging in their chest. And it's just sort of. It's weird. Yeah. <laughs> and some of it, and this is, this is a, it's actually a, the, a really <laughs> gross part about it is that they would also the doctors would want people that had um, deformities mm. or were unusually mm. tall or had a weird cancer, died of some sort of weird disease. And so even someone, you know, they always try to target fresh buried bodies. Mm-hmm. But they would also, t- if they knew someone had a unique medical condition, they were also, and so they'd get them at varying states of decay, even sometimes weeks and months after. So mm-hmm. that's what you're seeing. Yeah. Huh. I, I, this is actually a, uh, I guess, a related question to that. Was it? Mo- do they target mostly men? Uh, no, no. Uh, they target just, just whoever, no. whoever. I, I, uh, based on the, the the confirmed bodies that were taken, it's fifty fifty. As many women, uh, there wasn't there was no discrimination on age. Although they did not tend to go after real young kids mm-hmm. for I'm not sure what reason, but. Um, People that were um, really overweight, uh, bodies that were really overweight, for, it was a practi- it was an impracticality of, of being able to pull them out of the grave uh-huh. six feet under. Mm-hmm. Um, but with with those exceptions, um, it was the easiest the easiest bodies they could get, and it often ended up being rural and poor, you know, lower socioeconomic cemeteries. And you on you just mentioned the six feet under, and actually, when I was reading your book, I started searching because I thought, well, did they bury them? more shallow back then but it was i mean it's well from what i could find it was six feet yeah and that that started way before that which just yeah. made me more impressed at how they could get down yeah. there with shovels in the middle of night and taking it all out yeah that's just wild so i was just, I was just googling whether it's well i know whether it's a crime <laughs> 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 what the current laws are around disturbing the graves right. yeah around gra- disturbing a gravesite i don't think they specifically say grave robbing in any of these um but i think that there are uh, a lot of them are felonies to be honest like possessing okay. those things i think that they like so it looks like the laws got stricter over time i assume in the intervening years between then and, now. and medical <laughs> schools like, hey. have enough bodies Right. So yeah. I guess there's no. Yeah. They, yeah. But I think that one of the things that you wrote that kind of just made me think is that you could visit a cemetery in, in, in Indianapolis and you don't know where there are actually people buried and where it's just yeah. empty graves. And I don't know why that kind of struck me. Yeah. I mean, it's like anyone from basically the 1870s to 1903, like, are they there? Right. The best, the most amazing case. Uh, crazy case, frankly, is a cemetery that's no longer in Indianapolis called Greenlawn. Mm-hmm. And um, in the 1870s, the sextant was pleading with the Indianapolis police to come and provide protection at night because the, uh, the graves were being robbed. Nothing happened. Cemetery was closed in 1899, and they start moving bodies to a big cemetery called Crown Hill Cemetery. And when they got into the graves of those buried in the 1880s, 1870s, 1890s, <laughs> there was no one to move because the graves were all gone. Wow. The cemetery's gone. Today, it is being, um, it is this uh, space slated to be a new soccer stadium for Indianapolis's Major League oh Soccer. Oh, my gosh. And, I, and I think all the bodies have been moved, but it's like, you know, Stephen King warned us never to build over a, a <laughs> right. cemetery ever. <laughs> 
We'll await the outcome. That's right. Your haunted soccer stadium, go for it. You know, those teams are not going to do well. I I think this is an interesting, a really interesting. uh, I'm glad you covered it in such an in-depth and like not shying away from the gruesome aspects of this, because I think that. I guess a dehumanizing sort of like that, that sick feeling you get in your stomach when someone is sort of like mutilate, mutilating or think the thought of those kinds of things is, 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 uh, an important one to wrestle with even today. Cause there are certain things, and, and this is a relatively new thing, but I don't know if you've ever seen the bodies exhibit where they do like, where oh, they yeah. classified yeah, yeah. all mm-hmm. of the blood mm-hmm. vessels and mm-hmm. nervous systems of those folks. There was something recently came out that, that, you know, a lot of those bodies came from China and were acquired under, well, a little bit of some of this, Shady. you know, yeah, mm-hmm. people looking mm-hmm. the other way because, like, we need bodies and no one really wants to do this. <laughs> right. right. Like, no one's yeah. volunteer. I mean, I'm sure there are some folks, but generally speaking, it's not a lot of volunteers. Um, so it, it is the, the acquisition of human remains for educational purposes for legitimate reasons is still something that happens today. Just yeah. not mm-hmm. as much here, I would assume, uh, in the United States. By including the images, it really brings, because if you just hear, oh, the medical schools need it to make better doctors, which is good for everyone. Like, okay, I, you know, I understand that. But then like Rufus dug up his girlfriend. When you see these images and it really becomes personal, then you can understand both sides of the story and really understand how yeah. gruesome this was. Um, yeah. But it was also a money-making profession. I mean, they were making good money off of it. So... Rufus would get paid uh, like fifty dollars a corpse, which was an astronomical yeah. amount wow. in nineteen oh two. That is an enormous amount of money. Yep. I did not yeah. expect that. Now he had to pay out some of his crew. Um, right. The papers talk about bodies going anywhere from twenty to thirty dollars, legal bodies too. And so the, the college is still paid for legal legal right. bodies, but they had to procure a certain amount of money. But anywhere from twenty to fifty dollars was the going rate. Yeah, that's a lot to be shelling out at the time. A lot of money. I guess, yeah. I guess they thought it was very important. <laughs> that is crazy. Well, um, for everyone listening, I hope we satisfied uh, uh, your ghoulish Halloween-y uh, uh, <laughs> inclinations with this episode. Uh, but you should still buy there- the book. You should absolutely <laughs> buy the book. If, if yes, anything, just for the pictures. Just for the pictures um, alone. Come on. <laughs> Whether you're in Indianapolis or not. Um, oh, yeah. But uh, if you are in Indianapolis, and something I said, I repeat on the show constantly, like, go see some of these places. There's, there's yeah. cooler stuff when, you know, you're driving by a cemetery, you know, go if they, go look up something about it. Look up the history of these things. Um, yeah, like I always say, you live within an hour's drive of something cool, historically, mm-hmm. and you might as well learn about it locally. Support you. your mm-hmm. local Yeah, history. go see it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Chris, is there anything you'd like to uh, leave our audience with? Um, any um, besides, you know, go buy the book. <laughs> the go buy the book. The, what I because the story again has been told many, many times, and I think what I do, what I hope to do, unique in the book is the particulars. It's the it's just mm-hmm. weird. It's a weird story. It was a weird story then too, mm-hmm. which made it so sensational. It was spread and shared all across the United States, um, but it doesn't fit. It just doesn't fit with my – did when I did the research and wrote it down, it didn't fit with my understanding of, of, of the time. And so, like, mm-hmm. it just sits as this outlier, this thing. In 1902, I mean, that's 120-some years ago, but, like, it isn't that long. And it, like, seems like it, once you sort of – like, you were talking about Lynn, see the photos, see all mm-hmm. of it together, you realize just how crazy this thing was five generations yep. back. You know? Not that long ago. Not that long ago. All right, folks. Was, I hope that wasn't too gruesome for for y'all. <laughs> <laughs> it, um, is uh, do you have any future work? Uh, anything you're currently working on? Um, uh, maybe interested. I'm writing a book now about um, about ghost stories, historical Ooh. ghost stories oh. in Muncie, where I'm from, Muncie in Delaware County. So. Oh, oh, we like that. Awesome. We'll have you back. Yeah, so, great. Maybe next Halloween. Yeah, yeah. yeah next, next Halloween. You can be our yearly Halloween guest. But um, that sounds <laughs> great. Is there, is there, uh, do, are you uh, active on social media or do you have uh, yeah. like a Substack or anything so, that you can follow? Uh, Facebook and Instagram. Uh, I uh, write a uh, bi- bi-weekly column for our local paper, the Star Press, and that's mm-hmm. about um, local history. And then uh, a lot of my stuff appears. I, I'm involved with the Delaware County Historical Society here in Muncie, and a lot of my writing appears in newsletters, blog posts, that kind of thing. Well, fantastic. We'll we'll make sure to put links of all of those things Great. in the Wonderful. show notes. Yeah. Yeah. 
Cool. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, for thank you, Chris, for being here, and uh, for all the audience, make sure you follow Too Complicated for History on all the socials, and subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if you would like to listen to an ad-free version of the show, you can subscribe to Into History and gain access to not only this show but like half a dozen of the some of the best history podcasts that are available right now, um, including American History Tellers and History That Doesn't Suck. So um, go and do that. Uh, thanks again, Chris, for being here. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. Thank you for listening to the full episode of Too Complicated for History. We hope you enjoyed the episode, and if you did, please leave us a review on Odyssey, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Be sure to follow us on our social media platforms at 2C4H underscore podcast, or check out the link in the description. This will keep you in the loop for show updates, new episodes, and exclusive content. Too Complicated for History is a podcast from Primary Source Media, produced by Patrick Long and Lynn Price Robbins. Edited and mixed by Curtis Fritsch. Opening theme music by Sheena Biratella.